Recently, we talked about some options for streaming your D&D game. This time, I'm going to go through my actual setup, including all of the software that I use to run the game and stream the session. Welcome to Geek Philosophy, where we love geeky wisdom. If you're new to the channel, my name's Brian, and we release new videos weekly, so please consider liking and subscribing and turning on all the notifications so you don't miss out on anything. Come on, it's free. Just click somewhere then do that. As always, I'm going to show you how I'm handling this topic, so that means it's not the only way to do it, and it's not even the right way to do it. It's just the way that works best for me. Stick around till the end of the video and I'll show you an example of a session I prepped and how I pulled all this together. Okay, let's roll. Google Drive has kind of been a staple for me and since I want to collaborate with my players no matter what device they work with, I use Google Drive as my primary method of taking notes and providing handouts and even building the campaign guide for my world. So this may not always be the case though, and if I was gonna change anything about my notes or file sharing, this is the easiest one to switch out. But for now, it's working great. For me, I chose YouTube as my streaming platform, and since I had already planned to launch Geek Philosophy as a YouTube channel, I knew this is where I was gonna stream my campaigns. It just made sense for me to use the same platform so I could build a connection between some of the advice I was providing with the actual games that I used some of my own advice in. And also by streaming to YouTube, it gave me an opportunity to record my behind the screens videos and have a playlist for both the campaign and the behind the screens information, bring it all together. YouTube also provides a royalty-free music library in its design studio, so this let me build out playlists for my games and add music to my regular videos, all without breaking any copyright laws. There are other applications that you can use and sources for royalty-free music, but I wanted to keep it simple as I was starting and just stick with YouTube. Also, my reason for using YouTube is it's the second biggest search engine on the planet, right behind Google. So if there was a good chance for anybody to find my content if they were looking for it. When it comes to characters and rules and the setup of a campaign, I haven't found anything that works better for me than D&D Beyond. I have a paid DM account that includes all of my content that I've purchased over the years, and since I use the My Campaigns feature, my players can access that same content all with their free accounts, so it works great. I also create homebrew items there and homebrew backgrounds that are specific to my campaign world, so that's cool too. It's also an amazing way to streamline the rules for my players, and I can pull up their character sheet and share it during the stream, and then show them how things work if I have any teachable moments that come up. When it comes to character portraits, I didn't really stream this in the How to Stream Your Dungeons and Dragons game video, but it's really a nice to have and not a necessity, but it's a nice to have. Hero Forge is an amazing company. It's an online application that lets you create your own custom miniatures even in color, by the way. And I have a paid account, which I've used to order several of the physical miniatures, but also I backed their Kickstarter to get the color minis. I mean, it's great, guys. Check out the color minis. And it's amazing what can be done with this 3D printing technology, but the paid account also lets me download character portraits and virtual tabletop tokens. So I can create a visual of my NPCs, and then the players can create visuals of their characters, and then we can leverage them for our campaign. you are likely going to need other types of graphic design if you're using any types of handouts or things like that. And even if you're artistic, I highly recommend Canva. It's a free to use graphic design tool and you can create so many different things with this. You can use it for graphic overlays, for presentations, for video designs, for logos, for all kinds of different things. And if you go with the premium version, it opens up a ton of other things that you can use like additional stock photos or vector graphics or even video and audio files that you can use. So I bet you can spot some things during the campaign that I've used from Canva. I used Canva in one way, shape or form during the entire Relics of the Ancients campaign. If you've ever needed to write up a description for something or more importantly, if you've ever had to describe something on the fly because somebody took you in a different direction, Describe is perfect for you. I've leveraged Describe to pull word-for-word -word text and use that to flesh out a description, but more often than not, I actually just use it 
to prompt my own way of saying something. There is a free version of this tool, so use it. And there is also various paid levels that will give you additional content based on your level. And besides the amazing descriptive text that they put in for pretty much everything you can think of, there are also maps that you can leverage for your campaign. By the way, leave a comment below if you recognize anything that I used from Describe in the Relics of the Ancients campaign. You'll find something. Besides making me smile every time I say it, Owlbear Rodeo is my favorite free application for D&D, period. It's everything I need in a virtual tabletop without all the stuff I don't need. D&D Beyond does most of the heavy lifting I need when it comes to running the game from a rules perspective. I just need something that will help me with the visual representation of combat. Owlbear Rodeo does this perfectly. It's a streamlined system, but there are actually a lot of different things that are improving all the time with this. They even have Fog of War. It's free, guys. Check it out. So now we come to how I pull it all together. Ecamm Live is my virtual meeting and conferencing software. It's my live streaming app and broadcasts my stream to YouTube. It's my scene planner. It's even my stream chat tool. I can do all this stuff like set a pre-stream countdown to display on YouTube, put a timer for my break, I can adjust player cams before we get started to make sure everybody looks their best. It's awesome. And because things in Ecamm are scene specific, I can also tie audio tracks to each scene so that they play automatically or end automatically or loop depending on what I need. There's a bunch more and full disclaimer, this is a paid application and it only works on Mac. So keep that in mind if you're trying to mimic a setup like mine. Beware of mimics, by the way. But let me tell you, it works great. I started with OBS and it worked, but it was taking up a lot of computing power and I couldn't make it stream the way I wanted to. So even with my base model M1 Mac Mini, Ecamm Live is running perfectly. Enough talking about it. Let me show you an example of how I pull this all together. Okay, so this is Ecamm Live, and this is one of the scenes I created to help run the campaign. So Ecamm, you, you'll see, has these panels that you can actually rearrange how you'd like, um, depending on the way you like them. And I can actually save these as a certain profile. Um, I've got these set as my uh, Relics of the Ancient campaign profile. I also have a different set for behind the screens, and that just makes sure that I can save my preferences or the layout of everything I want to use. So with Ecamm, I can uh, I can hide the controls, which I have hidden right now. Let me go ahead and show them. So there are the controls, and you can see that like everything here is selectable because I have just drag and drop things in or I can actually use these overlays such as the text and add that in. There's a lot I can do here. I can also just drag and drop images in. I dropped this video in as an overlay and I set it so that it would loop when it was done. So it just keep going over and over. I can also, and I'll, I'll bump up the sound a little bit so you can hear it. I can also add music just by dropping the music in and then once it's there I can even change whether I want this to stop when the scene ends. I could keep it going for all scenes. In this case I'm going to stop when scene ends so that way I can set the music by scene. And speaking of scenes you'll see this panel over here that lets me change from one scene to the next. Now I'm using my mouse on this just so it's uh, easier for you to see as I change it but I also have a stream deck. Uh, I didn't include this in the uh, instructions of things that I use because it's a recent addition, but the Stream Deck lets me push a button to change these scenes and I can set things with macros. But for this, it's really simple, guys. I create a scene, I can go back to this view. All of these placeholders that you see here will be filled when my participants join. So I'm using the interview mode. You only see my camera on the interview mode because uh, no one else is in this call. If there were, then this would be filled with guest one, guest two, guest three, and those are my players. And it remembers where they are. So as soon as their video feed comes in, it populates these. So no matter where I have guest one, guest two, and guest three, those video feeds will come in once I've got these set up. 
It's pretty interesting um, setup because it's so easy that you kind of forget the fact that you had to do all the setup to begin with and because the setup didn't take very long. It was an image background for me. It was adding overlays uh, with either cameras or some titles. Um, and yeah, I was ready to go. I can also set the destination for where I want to stream to. So in my case, I stream to YouTube, but I can also record these, which is what I do for my behind the screens videos. I just record the stream and what you see on this video in the middle here is what's going to show for my players and for the recorded video. All of the audio that comes through, including my camera and all the other cameras, I can adjust the sound level there, and that's what get pipe, gets piped out to the stream. So it's really simple, uh, really easy to use. Um, so this is where it kind of comes together, guys. So uh, I'm going to show you just a couple of the features that I mentioned earlier um, for how I bring this together, how I do things like um, use Owlbear Rodeo to go ahead and move things around and live stream that. I'll show you what that looks like from the Owlbear Rodeo setup. Um, also, uh, if I want to have a break, you're not going to hear me right now because the audio is going to cut out for a second. But during that break period, I had a timer set. When that timer gets down to a certain number, it automatically moves to the scene. And I, I set it to do that. So I knew that, hey, break time is five minutes. When we're back from break, it should move to this next scene, which I created here. And it was really just a duplicate of the scene up here. So I didn't even have to create it again. Really easy, guys. Um, the other thing is, uh, while I'm offline or during a break, the, the people can talk to me through this chat to tool over here. You'll see this window. Um, they can send messages even during the live stream so that we can chat with one another if we need to. But also, if we're in a starting soon segment and uh, there are all the microphones muted for the external stream, we can still hear each other if we need to talk to one another. So it's it's really well done. Uh, big props to Ecamm uh, for putting this together. Again, I'm not sponsored by them, although if they would like to reach out, I will do that um, because they're just a great tool. And I'll, I'll let me know in the comments below if you want to see any more detail about this. I can point you in some directions, but I can also shoot one um, a little bit more detailed about actually creating all of these very scenes. Okay, so let's dive into the first thing, which is Google Drive, because this is how I kind of manage all of my campaign notes and keep things rolling as I go. So you'll see that because I use the headers, I can actually have a summary at the side, which is hyperlinked. And let's jump into the Into the Ruin session three. Uh, this is what I called the campaign to keep my um, uh, brain straight when I was doing the sessions. The players didn't have that title. Um, but this was really one of the first times that I had a puzzle in the game, so I knew that I was going to have this type of scenario. But doing it online meant that I had to have a way of taking a physical puzzle that I would have had at the table and turning it into something that was visual. And I'll show you how I did that with Canva. Another thing that was really useful was when I went into the map locations, one, I had a map that I uploaded into Owlbear Rodeo. I'll show you how that works. And then also, um, there was all this text that I knew that I was going to need to describe things. So um, first, let me show you one of my favorite things, uh, which is describe. So here is, for example, a library. I modified this, but you can tell from the beginning, this room seems to function as a library for the facility, that this is where I got a lot of that information from. In Describe, you can kind of go in and just search a topic. So I'm going to do library, and I'm pretty sure I can find the same posting that I used previously. So let me scroll down a little bit. Um, yeah, library, it's right here. And so I can already tell it gives me a little bit of a preview of what it's going to be. I click it, and here is the uh, text that I used almost word for word in that part of the story and I cobbled everything together to make sure that my notes reflected that so here we go okay so here's me keeping track of notes and keeping things going with Google Drive pretty straightforward but you might also notice that I used uh, some type of graphic program to be able to create the thumbnail for my image for the thumbnail for the live stream that was going on and to advertise for 
the time and when we were showing things. So this is Canva and Canva um, gives me a lot of different opportunities. And so if I look here at the homepage of Canva, I can do video, presentation, logos, all kinds of stuff that have templates involved. Um, or you could uh, jump over and create things like, um, you know, here's a little image that shows uh, a um, picture that I pulled from their library. I searched photos and was able to pull in things. So you can search all kinds of things. I'm sure I'd found one that worked best for this at the time, but you know, do your search, pull it in. And then also um, you've got the ability to pull in placeholders for where you would put images or overlays and text itself. So this is really great. On top of that, you might notice that I have character profiles and this character profiles would be turned into a video. So this is an export from another tool that I mentioned, which is HeroForge. So the players created what they thought their character should look like and gave me links to them. And so um, I created them on my account so I can then um, purchase the minis if I need to later and we do something in person. But everybody had their view of what the character was and because they were saved, if the character changed over time as they were leveling up, we could change what this is. I mentioned before that we had a puzzle at the beginning and that puzzle was something I wanted to be interactive but I couldn't really turn it over to the player. So I was having them describe what they were gonna do and then I would make the choice. In Ecamm, you can share your screen, you can share your display. So I just cropped everything down to the only thing I was sharing was this stonework area with the inscriptions in it. And then I put in some shapes with some uh, like gemstones. So I can say Ruby and graphic. So if I wanted to change this and make another type of thing, I could just pull it over. And now I have a different gemstone I could have used. And because I'm the one controlling this, I can move this around. What I did here was I created some gemstones and then I made a darker version of them that are locked below to kind of be the placeholders where they fit into the rock. And then as they were touching each one, I would move it over and then the colors would change accordingly. And because this is all in this program, I'm, I'm, you know, I have it saved. I can also then duplicate this if they were going to do an etching. And here's an etching if they did that of the inscription. So it works out really well. Again, Canva, it's free. If you get, use the pay version, you get some more stuff. You get more uh, access to uh, more pro tools and things like that. But even the free version is pretty powerful. Okay, speaking of power, D&D Beyond. So this is what I use for all the rule sets. So because I've purchased some things and I can kind of go up to sources. So for example, I have purchased the Explorer's Guide to Wildmount. And this is a source book that is used by Critical Role and it's their campaign world. But it also gave me insight into how some things were done and how I might be able to adapt the uh, sort of the style of certain things or the design sort of methodology into my own way of doing things. So I use for example, the Heroic Chronicle as a way of doing our character prologue that you might have seen. So check out that video to learn more about that. At any rate, since I have it and I've created a campaign and in that campaign, Relics of the Ancients, again, put my image there and description, all the players that have been added to this campaign now have access to that information. So not only that information, all the other stuff that I bought and any of my homebrew creations. So. I've created items and backgrounds. So there's an Athenaeum student background. So this is the one that Henrik took because he came up through the Athenaeum and he had a spe special background uh, with special abilities and so on. So this is my way of kind of pulling everything in virtually, but also I can pull this up on stream and show them, hey, here's how your character would work. Here's how the special ability is. It's, it's really great. So can't speak highly enough of D&D Beyond. I mentioned before that we also had maps. This is an example of that ruin that they went to first where they were going to be entering in this door and they had to defeat the puzzle first. And then here you go. So this Owlbear Rodeo is amazing. I can upload the map. I can bring in tokens. If, for example, there was a bad guy that was in this room and I needed to have one and I didn't have an image, I could use one of the pre-developed icon tokens that are already over there and boom, bad guy. And this could represent any creature you want. You'd let them know what it is. Um, you could even do things like use this skeleton 
as a better example, and maybe this is a skeleton, or maybe it's something else. Um, it's a great way of being able to um, show placement between things. You can also set conditions by adding circles around things. You can give labels to it. It's a really good way of being able to do this. And again, you can use all kinds of different maps or a blank one if you want to start out you know, a random encounter that you didn't plan for. Again, you can pull in the tokens of people that you've already loaded, um, or you can just pull in some you know, kind of standard ready-made tokens that can serve as your placeholders. So it's a great way of pulling this together. Well, thanks again for contemplating a little geek philosophy about streaming a D&D game. And if you're a little nervous about setting up your own D&D live stream, let me remind you of a little geek philosophy from Morpheus in The Matrix. You have to let it all go, Neo. Fear, doubt, disbelief. Free your mind. Cheers.